Tihei Māori Ora, he mihi nui ki te mana whenua o tēnei rohi, wai taha ka te māmo i kaitahu, ki nga mauna whakahi, ki nga wai i tere nei, ki nga ranga tira huhua, tēnei te mihi, tēnei te mihi. Ki nga mate o te wā, rātu, kui e whetu rangatia, haere, haere, moe mai rā. Rātou ki a rātou, tātou ki a tātou. I nga rangatira, i nga ahurangi, i nga kaimahi, i nga tawira, i nga humahi, i nga tangata katoa. Tēnā koutou. Ahurangi a Ben Chantel, nga mihi nui ki a koe i hoa. He mihi hoki tēnei ki tō whānau me o hoa. Nō reira, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Um, greetings to you all. I am Tony Ballantyne and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of External Engagement. And it's my great honour to be hosting this IPL this evening. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you who are gathered here in person. Those of you who are online both currently, hopefully, and uh, in the future. Uh, it's fantastic that you've all gathered to share this occasion with Ben this evening. I just realised in my mihi I should have acknowledged you, Helen, our Acting Vice-Chancellor, so uh, tēnā koe e hoa. Um, these are very special events. The fact that we are wearing these robes are an indicator of that specialness. We wear these robes very rarely these days, at least here at the University of Otago. They are saved for very special occasions, for graduations when we celebrate the end of the academic journeys of our students. And for these events, inaugural professorial lectures, when we gather to mark the promotion of a colleague to the highest academic rank within the university, celebrating their scholarship, their research and contribution to our institution, to our communities, to our country. These events are really special because they embody and celebrate the endeavours that are at the heart of the university, the scholarly journey, the creation of new knowledge, and the transmission of knowledge to students, to colleagues, and to the interested public. So it is great that we've all gathered here this evening to celebrate both the outstanding scholar that Ben is, and more broadly, the critically important place of knowledge in our community. I'll hand over in a moment to Professor Will Sweetman, who will offer a f uh, fuller and more formal, or perhaps more formal introduction to Ben. Um, but personally, I just wanted to note that Ben is a true all-rounder, a simply outstanding researcher, a great teacher, an important leader on our campus. Since arriving at Otago, Ben has proved himself to be an exemplary institutional citizen. I worked closely with Ben when I was PVC, and I was always struck by his positivity, uh, by his desire to make things better and to create opportunities uh, for current and future students and for his colleagues. Those are qualities that I think are greatly valued by all the people gathered here this evening, Ben, who are very lucky uh, to work with you. Uh, so, uh, Kati, enough from me. I will now hand over to Professor Sweetman. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko Will Sweetman tōko ingoa, uh, ko te manu, uh, manutaki o te puna pāpari, uh, kei te manu whanua e mihi ana, kei te rangatira o te whariwananga ko Otago uh, e mihi ana anō. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Will Sweetman and I'm the head of the School of Social Sciences. Uh, which is the academic unit within which uh, Ben's uh, religion program uh, sits. So it is my pleasure and privilege uh, to introduce Ben Chantal to you today. I think I first met Ben uh, at a rooftop restaurant overlooking the Bay of Bengal. He remembers. <laughs> uh, in about 2008. Uh, at the time, uh, he was a PhD student uh, at the University of Chicago. And like me, he was in India learning languages, although he's done a much better job of it um, than, than I have. <laughs> Uh, ben struck me then as an extremely bright uh, and very likable young scholar, although not very tall. <laughs> although he told me then uh, that he'd studied at Otago, I never imagined that he and I would later become colleagues. 
Uh, ben received his PhD from Otago, uh, from Chicago rather, in, in 2012 uh, and took up his appointment at Otago uh, as a lecturer the following year, although he already had experience of teaching at Chicago, uh, at Auckland and at Victoria. Uh, as Tony mentioned, he has been... Uh, uh, Yeah. He's been an outstanding colleague. Uh, much of the success, it, it would be one of my talks unless I did this. <laughs> I think Ben would feel insulted if I, <laughs> if I didn't. Uh, much of the success that we've achieved in the religion program over the last decade is, is directly attributable to Ben's immense talent and his prodigious appetite, partly for work but also for food. Thank you, Henry. <laughs> In the decade that he's been here, Ben has received multiple awards uh, for teaching, uh, for research, and for supervision. Uh, so in teaching, he began with a, an award from OUSA uh, in 2015, uh, followed up with a, a Divisional of Humanities Award in 2018, and then a University Award uh, in 2019. Uh, for research, he received the Early Career Award for Distinction in Research in 2016, uh, and again, follow this up with the Roe Heath Trust Award and Carl Smith Medal uh, in 2021. He also received a perfect score uh, in the 2019 PBRF round, uh, 700 out of 700. And um, for those of you who don't understand PBRF, lucky you, um, but this basically makes him the Nadia Kometsky uh, of research, only he is slightly taller than her, I think. <laughs> Uh, and in 2016, he was also a finalist uh, in the OUSA Supervisor of the Year Awards. And those are just the awards that Otago has given him. There are many others on his CV. Um, as soon as the university introduces an award for the best head of department, I feel pretty sure Ben will target and then win that one too. Uh, in research, Ben has systematically identified and published in all of the very first-rate journals uh, in the multiple fields across which he works, uh, religious studies, uh, Asian studies, and law. Uh, Ben and I have taught and supervised together. And he has made me a better teacher and a supervisor. He has a remarkable ability to identify what is truly important and interesting in a research uh, project. Uh, and three of the five PhDs that he supervised uh, to date to completion have been added to the divisional's list of exceptional uh, theses. Uh, ben and I have been close colleagues, as I said, for over a decade now, but it is a measure of how much he does uh, that when I had the privilege of writing the head of department assessment statement on his promotion application, there were many, many things on his CV that I had no idea uh, that he was doing. Uh, a recent example of this uh, is his initiative with uh, our divisional Kaithina Māori, Tanaya Brown, uh, to run essay writing workshops uh, for ta Tawira Māori. All of this is done uh, without fanfare, uh, just because it is, it's part of what Ben does. His energy and commitment to his vocation as a teacher, a colleague, and a colleague are truly exceptional. He is, however, still not very tall. <laughs> Having mentioned Ben's talent as a teacher, I think it's important for me to conclude this introduction by issuing a kind of health warning. If during the course of this lecture this evening you feel a sudden and overwhelming urge to change the direction of your life and to take up the academic study of religion or to enroll for a major in religion, please do not be alarmed. This is a very common side effect of listening to Ben's lectures. Fortunately, there is an antidote available. You just need to attend one of mine. So safe in that knowledge, I would now like to invite Ben to deliver his lecture, Law's Karma, Cause and Effect in Courtroom and Cosmos. I only did that hug to show you how short I was. <laughs> so he wasn't lying about that. Um, God, I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm so overwhelmed, in fact, that I, I had a speech written out here, but um, I think in light of that, I'm just going to go freelance. No, I'm just kidding. I would never do that. I'm so freaked out about this lecture. I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous. Uh, okay. 
tēnā koutou katoa um, ki te mana whenua kai tāhu whānui e, e mihi ana, uh, ki nga rangatira o te whare wānanga o tākau uh, e mihi ana anau. Uh, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, welcome to those of you. Thank you so much for coming here, uh, people both in the flesh and online. Uh, I want to give a special acknowledgement to my sister and my nephew Sam and my sister's, part sister's uh, partner Meg for coming all the way uh, from New York for this. God, Will's going to make me cry. Um, I want to thank my colleagues in religion, uh, John, Elizabeth, Joseph, Dean, Greg, our newest colleague, Mohammed. Um, I, I mean, I don't know how other people feel about who they work with, but I feel particularly lucky. I want to give a special thank you to my students, past and present, who are here today. Um, everything that I do at this university, for the most part, I, I try to have you in mind, and, and it's really special to have you here. But most of all, I want to thank uh, my family, my, my wife Paula, and my two wonderful sons, Henry and Oliver. Um, if there's anything at all to celebrate professionally, for me, it's, it's because of them and their support. It's them that's made it possible. Oh. Throughout the history of Buddhism, there's been a long-standing debate about karma. Most of you will have heard of karma. It's that famous law of cause and effect, which, be which has become part of our popular culture. That cosmic principle that links present actions with future outcomes. Or, to quote Justin Timberlake, the idea that what goes around goes around, goes around, comes all the way back around. But none of you saw Justin Timberlake quote coming that soon in my IPL. Uh, this Buddhist debate over, over karma is not about whether the principle is true. For most Buddhists, karma is unquestionable. It just happens. Do something good, good things will come. Do something to bad, well, I warned you. Karma operates like gravity. It's predictable, mechanical, inevitable, dropping moral apples on your head whether or not you believe in it. But while Buddhists agree that karma works, they don't always agree about how it works. Precisely how do one's actions in the present influence one's condition in the future? Does karma work in a one-for-one -one way? Is there a single consequence for every, each and every action one does? And if so, when can one expect that consequence? Within an hour? Within our lifetime? After all, according to the Buddha, we've all been reborn countless numbers of times already. So many, in fact, that it's likely that the person sitting next to you right now in this lecture was either your parent or child in a previous lifetime. The idea that karma works in a one-for-one -one way is confirmed by some Buddhist texts. These texts will say that actions, karma, are like seeds planted in a fertile ground. Those seeds give rise to fruits, which we harvest in the future. These texts tell us that we are, we are all vast moral plantations, fields of karmic plants, each one the fruition of some action we've done in the past. This is not the only way to think about karma, however. Other texts suggest that karma might actually work in aggregate. Rather than one action producing one result, it's the totality of our actions that matter. In this view, karma works more like batting averages or credit scores. What matters most is your moral performance over the long term, your cumulative balance of good actions and bad. It turns out that kings in South Asia were particularly fond of this second model. We know this because they kept written ledgers, tallying up all their good actions. These ledgers, called merit books, gave kings comfort that if they gave enough money to charity or built enough Buddhist temples, they could counterbalance the harms they caused by waging war and punishing criminals. In other words, they could ensure a good rebirth by investing heavily in karmic offsets. These debates about karma have not been resolved. Those of us who study Buddhism learn a lot about what karma is, but gain very little certainty about how karma works. The same could be said about the study of law, but we'll get there. 
Writing this lecture has been an unsettling experience for me, not just because I knew Will was going to introduce me, but because of the peculiar nature of IPL talks. Academics like me usually leave personal details out of public lectures. Yet in an IPL, it's customary to provide the audience with a biography, a personal and, secular, a personal and scholarly story that explains how one got here. It's an activity that, to my mind, has the flavor of a karmic ledger, an accounting of for one's present conditions by listing one's previous actions. This kind of thing feels particularly weird for me. Weird because it all feels so strange. So strange that a Jewish kid from Chicago, who spent most of his undergraduate life training to be a medical doctor, is now a professor of Buddhist studies in New Zealand. My wife Paula also finds it strange. You see, we actually met here at Otago just about 25 years ago, when I came to Dunedin for one semester as a study abroad student. The year was 1998. Flannel shirts were cool, <laughs> the first time. And I remember in July of that year, Paula and I sitting around her squalid flat on George Street, close, huddling close around a space heater, eating two-minute noodles, listening to Portishead on mini-disc, <laughs> and agreeing that Dunedin probably wasn't for us. My younger son, Henry, now goes to school across the street from that flat. My favorite lecturer from that study abroad, Greg Dawes, is now my colleague. And I even have a mini-disc player in my car. <laughs> is all of this coincidence or karma? My interest in Buddhism is easy enough to place. It stems from my first year as an undergraduate at Bowdoin College. In those pre-internet days, students registered for classes by copying enrollment codes on a piece of paper. When it came to my elective, I mixed two numbers up and ended up not in a class on Shakespeare, but a seminar on South Asian religions. However, I was quickly enthralled. In that class, I learned that Buddhism was an incredible tradition, filled with compelling philosophical ideas, amazing, uh, uh, and an amazing textual history that stretches back three millennia. I still feel that way, and almost every week I pinch myself at how lucky I am to be able to teach and research about it and get paid for it. It was a professor in that seminar, John Holt, who suggested that I study in Sri Lanka, a country with strong links to Buddhism as well as a long-standing civil war. And it was in Sri Lanka that I first began to ask the questions that would lead me away from, social, away from medicine and towards social science. How does religion influence politics? And what role does religion play in human conflict? When it came to Buddhism, these questions seemed particularly stark. How could a religion based on the moral laws of karma be implicated in a violent civil war? The first part of my academic career, I tried to answer these questions. I examined militaristic forms of Buddhism in Sri Lanka and Myanmar. I wrote about the use of Hindu and Christian symbolism by the Tamil Tigers in order to commemorate their fallen soldiers. I explored Buddhist justifications for war, as well as Buddhist teachings about toleration, coexistence, and peace. I learned two ancient languages, Pali and Sanskrit, and two modern vernaculars, Singhala and Tamil, and I've been struggling ever since to hold on to them. I conducted interviews and ethnographies, and I worked to translate ancient palm leaf manuscripts and modern political tracts. So a lot of my time recently has been spent translating texts like this. These are uh, texts written out on dried palmyra palms, which have a kind of a long shape. Uh, and when they go hard, when they get dry, they turn into a kind of wood, and you can then take a metal stylus and etch into these things. Uh, the sheaths are then bundled together with a piece of string, and they, they look like sort of yay long and yay wide and about that thick. Recently, with the encouragement of my colleague John Shaver, I've also started engaging in quantitative analyses, using public data sets and creating my own. None of this I could have done alone, and I'm only here today because of the tremendous help of friends, families, family, colleagues, and teachers in Sri Lanka, New Zealand, uh, the US, and other places. Um, and there's just a few names here in this word cloud. I'm sure there's many I've, I've, I've left out. I, was nervous and probably forgot some. If 
I've learned anything in this work, it's that the crossroads of religion, politics, and conflict is a chaotic space filled with complex human behavior. Yes, religious ideas sometimes justify violence, all of them do, but it's nearly impossible to predict how those ideas will function in a given situation. Does religion motivate violence, or is it simply used to rationalize violence after the fact? Most of the time, scholars are stuck looking back in time after violence has occurred, trying to identify the causes for an event that's already happened, much like me trying to explain how I ended up becoming a professor of Buddhist studies. Alongside these scholarly questions, I've also had the chance to contribute to activism and policymaking. Working with judges, lawmakers, and lawyers, activists, and NGOs who are also concerned with minimizing conflicts over religion. And it's through this that I found myself leading a double life, half working on religion, half working on law. Law is never far from discussions of human conflict. In our modern world, law has become the go-to instrument for solving social problems. Too many people speeding? Pass some laws. Want to deal with a housing crisis? There's laws for that too. Our faith in law is not unlike Buddhists', Buddhist faith in karma. We trust that it works, even if we don't quite know how. In fact, we often talk about the law of karma as a way to underscore the similarity between the rules of the cosmos and the rules of the nation state, to emphasize their shared regularity, consistency, and impartiality. What if we took this comparison further? Rather than understanding karma through law, what if we tried to understand law through karma? Instead of talking about the law of karma, could we instead talk about the karma of law? After all, Law, like karma, forecasts a relationship between action and consequence. It links inputs and outcomes. Good laws are imagined to lead to good behaviors. Bad laws to things like civil war and conflict. At its best, at its most utopian, we imagine law to do its corrective work in the same manner as karma, mechanically, inevitably, gravitationally. It makes sense, then, that we'd be inclined to deal with the chaos of religious conflict by finding the right laws. This idea that law is the key to dealing with conflicts over religion has obsessed me. Returning to my karmic biography, this obsession might come from my childhood. Growing up as one of three triplets, alongside my sister Molly, who's here, and my brother Dave, uh, my parents relied on a family rule book in order to bring order and predictability into our sometimes chaotic household. That rule book, which is something like the love child of the US Constitution and the Code of Hammurabi, was creatively titled the Chantal Book of Rules. So this is, the, this is the, uh, an image from the first page of the 1992 edition. There were subsequent amended versions in 1993 and 1994. Um, this, of course, is the first section's freedom of movement curfew and rules about motor vehicles. I think we concluded last night when we read them to my kids uh, before they went to bed that our favorite rule was this one about public rooms. Uh, all public living areas need to be kept clean by everyone. If any of the rooms are left messy, bathroom, kitchen, den, that's lounge, uh, basement, etc., a universal fine of 25 cents will be applied to all children. <laughs> I don't know, is, is the universal fine common in law, Jess, is it? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, Paula and I are not above this, and we've recently adopted our own technique at home. Although somewhat less comprehensive than the Chantal Book of Rules, we recently finalized the PlayStation contract of 2021. <laughs> this is written in Ollie's hand. We had him copied out. Uh, it's shorter but equally autocratic document. I, I, I will direct you to the first clause. Uh, Mom and Dad have full authority over the PlayStation and can change the rules at any given time. Uh, it's not a very rule of law <laughs> document, but legal nonetheless. <laughs> uh, but perhaps my karma starts even earlier, in a previous lifetime. This kind of thing happens frequently in Buddhist narratives. The usual setup is something like this. The protagonist in a story finds themselves in some kind of predicament, like having to give an IPL lecture, and asks for the Buddha's help. 
The Buddha, rather than offering a solution to the problem, will tell the person about some other being, uh, often an animal such as a monkey, who faced a similar predicament in some earlier cosmic era. The Buddha will then go on to explain how the monkey solved the problem so long ago, before telling the protagonist that the monkey was actually them in a previous life and that they should solve their problem in a similar way. As for me, I squirm at the idea that I might have been a monkey professor thousands of lifetimes ago, but I can't say. That's the thing with karma. The route from action to outcome is opaque. Nevertheless, the more I engage in legal research, the more I come to feel the imprint of past lives. I learned recently, for example, that my great-grandmother was among the first class of women lawyers to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School, and among the earliest group of women to be admitted to the bar in Illinois. I learned that she served as legal counsel for Jane Addams, who's considered to be a founder of modern-day social work, a profession my wife now practices. I'm not sharing these details as part of the world's worst humble brag. I mean, if anything, they should chart a decline in the Schoenthal family. Uh, but they, these details do make a karmic point. The very mechanisms that one might use to test karma, that is, selectively looking for past actions that could produce present outcomes, also affirms the truth of karma itself. That is to say, in asking how karma works, we often aver that it does work. Modern theories of law depend on a similarly circular argument. We assume that particular laws produce particular outcomes. In assessing those claims, we look for the fit between social circumstances and legal design. Has Will Sweetman been driving slower lately? Well done speeding laws. Housing prices out of control? Bad job property law. When things go wrong, it's the input, that, the input that's at fault, not the model itself. That is to say, we affirm law's karma, even if we don't know how it works. This kind of thinking has been particularly common when it comes to designing constitutional law, a genre of law that in many places is thought of as the highest form of lawmaking, or as Bilbo Baggins might say, the one law to rule them all. Sorry, sorry I got carried away with the film memes and tried to get another punchline here. But I do think that Bilbo is right. We live in a world of constitutions. <laughs> out of nearly 200 constitutions in the world, only four, out of nearly 200 countries in the world, only four do not have a written constitution. We just happen to live in one of them. But even here, we look to a set of constitution-like basic laws. Those laws are presumed to structure our politics and act as expressions of our shared values. This faith in law and confidence in constitutions is a defining feature of our current age. As we speak, there are legal scholars working all over the world, advising countries on how to manage their social problems through constitutional provisions. In any given year, nearly 20% of the world's 198 constitutions will be undergoing processes of revision or replacement. And more than half of all constitutions in force right now were drafted in the last 30 years, many of them in the aftermath of conflicts like the one in Sri Lanka. One could even say that places like Sri Lanka or Sudan or Libya have become something like laboratories for constitutional law, proving grounds for law's karma. The problem is that while we may assume that constitutional law will resolve such social conflicts, we don't actually know that this is the case. Consider the types of conflicts that I research, which involve tensions among religious groups. To test the effects of constitutional law on this type of conflict, you would want to know, at the very least, whether religious tensions increase or decrease after new constitutions are introduced. Fortunately for us, there are two data sets, which, when combined, allow us to answer this question for one period in history. The first data set comes from the Pew Forum in the US which between 2007 and 2016 tracked religion-based social hostilities in every country in the world, giving each a score out of 10 based on 13 separate indicators. The second is a data set curated by two colleagues of mine, comparative constitutional law scholars Zach Elkins and Tom Ginsburg. This data set contains information about every single constitution created over the last 200 years. So what happened to religious hostilities during this period, 
when new constitutions were introduced. Oops. In this chart, you can see a list of 13 constitutions that were enacted between 2007 and 2011, as well as the change in religious hostilities that were measured at two years in red and three years in blue. Five years, sorry, in blue. All of these constitutions are generally considered to be improvements on what came before, or first ever charters designed for a newly formed polity. Almost all were designed with international expertise and the best of intentions. Yet even a casual look at this chart shows a worrying correlation between constitution making and religious hostility. In most cases, hostilities did not decrease, but increase, especially at five years. What kind of karma is this? Now let me stress, this chart shows correlation, not causation. There are far too many factors in these cases to draw a straight line between constitutional law and religious hostility. And this is precisely the point. Assuming a direct causality between legal inputs and social outcomes is, at the very least, an act of faith, particularly when it comes to something as complex as conflicts over religion. I have a confession to make. I'm an apostate in the church of law. I believe that law can help us solve some of the world's most urgent problems, but I do not believe that we should operate on faith alone. I demand proof of law's karma, research that shows how law works to reshape social life in particular places and times. Fortunately, I'm in good company. Over the last few decades, an entire field of academics has, been, has also been asking these questions. This field, referred to as law and society, or socio-legal studies, invites scholars from many academic disciplines to think about how law works on the ground to use techniques from the human sciences to stress test our assumptions about how law works. One of the things I'm most excited about uh, in my time at Otago has been the creation with colleagues uh, from law and from history of our own Otago Center for Law and Society, the first one in New Zealand. To think about law and human conflict in a law and society way is to think holistically about the work of law in our lives. Socio-legal scholars are fond of reminding lawyers that what happens in constitutional committees and in courtrooms represents only a fraction of law's influence in the world and a fraction of the world's influence on law. I recently shared the following slide with a class of law students here at Otago. The diagram is taken from some important socio-legal literature on the topic of disputes. The image is called a dispute pyramid, or given that we're in Dunedin, maybe a dispute iceberg. Its purpose is to highlight two facts about laws intermeshing with society. Firstly, formal legal procedures, such as litigation, tend to be unusual events in most people's lives, rarely the first port of call for dealing with conflict. Most of the time, we deal with conflict in other ways, drawing on other systems of legal ordering, of social ordering, such as tikanga, religion, local customs, or communal norms. Or we lean on informal modes of justice, like exclusion or shame. Not sure about this? Try cutting the queue at the supermarket, or requesting both the cookie time cookie and the cassava chips on an Air New Zealand flight. Kiwis, you know what I'm talking about. So deeply integrated into our lives are these other normative systems that they often feel like politeness or common sense some kind of deep natural impulse about right and wrong. Our world is dense with these systems, and most of the time we manage disagreement using them and not the courts. But even when we do use the courts, these other structures affect the way that we interpret and use state law. If you want to understand how law works, therefore, you have to think about the entire iceberg, both above and below the water. The goal of my research, this is the goal of my research, on the one hand, I want to know how state laws, such as constitutional law, work on the ground, both inside and outside of courtrooms. On the other hand, I also want to know about how these other normative systems, and particularly religious law, work alongside and sometimes in tension with state laws. Here, too, I want to give things a Buddhist twist. You see, like us, law can be said to have multiple lives. Above the water, we might say, is law's legal life. It's used by judges, lawyers, and legal draftspersons. 
Below the water is laws, life, and society, where legal, legal terms are used by everyday people as a language or framework for negotiating their world. I see this weekly when Oliver and Henry invoke their, quote, rights to TV time on Wednesday nights. It's also an observation that French sociologist Alexis de Tocqueville once made about Americans. Uh, he wrote over about 200 years ago, in America, the language of law has become a vulgar tongue. The spirit of law, which is produced in the schools and courts of justice, gradually penetrate their walls into the bosom of society, where it descends to all, so that at last the, the whole people contract the habits and tastes of the judicial magistrate. I give you once again the PlayStation contract of 2021. But that's not all. When it comes to important laws, like constitutions, we can also distinguish between laws pre-enactment life as the carefully worded product of political negotiation, and its post-enactment life as a collection of rules and principles intended to guide a country's shared future. Unlike the Buddhist birth stories I described above, however, legal principles function differently in these different lives. Consider, for example, one of the most common legal principles used to mediate conflicts over religion in the modern world uh, and in modern constitutions, the right to religious freedom. This pre feature, this principle, the right to religious free freedom, features prominently in about three quarters of the world's basic laws. For those drafting constitutions, religious freedom is a very useful principle, not just because it's a good thing, but because it's a vague thing. Raise your hand if you don't like religious freedom. Exactly. As you can see, it's a principle that virtually everyone can agree on. Religious majorities and minorities, secularists and the faithful, those who like the idea of religion in public, and those who oppose it. It's this very vagueness that makes religious freedom useful for lawmakers because it helps them find nominal consensus among populations with different, even conflicting attitudes but the proper place of religion in society. So much for the pre-enactment life of religious freedom. What happens post-enactment? The enactment of law is a magical process. Through solemn words and ceremonial gestures, the same vague phrases that had once been used to sidestep disagreement by politicians suddenly, suddenly reappear as weighty principles for resolving disputes. Through this ritual process, purposeful abstractions come to be treated as transparent principles for ordering and harmonizing society. Charmed phrases whose authority is undeniable, but whose meaning remains contestable, become our guidelines for dealing with strife. The problem is not so much that law does this in its legal life. After all, courts and lawyers are used to dealing with abstract concepts and playing with definitions. The problem is rather that law also tends to do this in its societal life, below the water. That is, it encourages us, to, encourages us to think of one kind of dispute, real life disagreements over specific issues, as another kind of dispute. Disputes over fixed freedoms and absolute rights, universal principles and non-negotiable ideals. It pushes us away from the usual local habitual practices of problem solving and towards the polarized setting of courts where complex, multi-sided disagreements are shoehorned into neat adversarial binaries, plaintiff and defendant, petitioner and respondent, to be decided by judges who are distant, both socially and spatially, from the parties who disagree. These are good things when you're prosecu prosecuting will for speeding, but not so good when you're mediating good faith disputes between concerned citizens over issues that matter deeply to them. I'm sorry to say that in my work on religion and constitutional law, I've observed as much, bad, as much bad karma as good. Constitutional law does not necessarily create disputes over religion, but it doesn't play a benign role either. My research reveals that law has the capacity to harden and deepen disputes, turning local disagreements over particular actions into high profile, high stakes, zero sum legal battles over what, religions, what religion is and how to make it free. My work shows that the legalization of disputes encourages actors to see victory rather than compromise, competition rather than communality. This story of law's karma does not appear in the usual places we look for law. 
It's not in collections of judicial decisions with their lists of virtuous precedents, nor is it in the speeches of lawmakers with their promises for a better world. These transcripts only provide law's official account of itself, which, like the merit books of Buddhist kings, tell a rather one-sided story of success. A karma-like reaping of drafters' intentions, fantasies of a better rebirth for society. Yet to rely on law's official records only is to see only the tip of the iceberg, to view part of its karmic ledger, but not the whole. My work sees, seeks a more holistic accounting, tracking disputes as they travel above and below the social waters, to test our assumptions about constitutions, and to look again at the many systems of social ordering beyond state laws that actually define our complex human world. Let me be clear. I do not think that we should give up on our legal system. For many things, law works well, or well enough. We need laws against polluting and will speeding. Yet when it comes to our most challenging social dilemmas, those that involve balancing collective values and goals, dilemmas that require us to live cooperatively in a diverse society, we need to experiment with new solutions, other ways of doing business. Nor can we wait either. This multicultural, multi-religious future is already here today in our bicultural country. New solutions might start with education. If we want to guarantee harmonious futures, it's not enough for us to train our students in law. We must also equip them to understand the complexity of society, its cultures, ideas, and histories. Call me old fashioned, but I still believe that university education should do more than provide vocational skills. It should encourage students to question our conventions and to see the world through other eyes. Recently, I've been trying to practice what I'm preaching by investigating other ways of imagining law and starting to ask how other groups of humans work to manage conflict. For the last five years, I've been documenting and analyzing one of the world's oldest, largest, and yet wildly understudied legal systems, the system of Buddhist law. This project has taken me to courts run by Buddhist monks and led me to discover fascinating law books written by monastic jurists. Buddhist law, I've found, brokers disputes without no notions of rights or damages, without jails or retribution. Yet it's been used for centuries to govern large populations of monks, nuns, and lay people throughout the continent of Asia. Buddhist legal institutions are not totally alien to our own legal systems. Buddhist law has judges and jurists, constitutions and lawmakers. But the guiding principles are different. Harmony rather than culpability. Rehabilitation rather than punishment. Given that these institutions have been around for thousands of years and have shaped the legal histories of about one-fifth of the world's population, maybe they have something important to say. After all, monastic fraternities are some of the largest and oldest human corporations in the world. I once asked a monastic judge about what non-Buddhist lawmakers could learn from Buddhist law. It was at a monastery in Sri Lanka. It was hot and late in the day. The monk pointed to a cow that was standing outside the monastery and commented, cows don't tell lies, cows don't drink alcohol, does that mean they're moral? I was tired and I shrugged, so he simply went on. Simply avoiding something does not make one moral, he said. To be moral, one must also cultivate goodness. The cow's way of life, I came to understand, was the way of life encouraged by state law, a life of trying to avoid bad things while being indifferent to good ones. It's an apt simile for modern secular legal systems, which pride themselves on not endorsing any particular notion of the good life. Yet as another monk put it, just because you walk away from one wall doesn't mean you're not heading towards another. If there's been a purpose to my academic journey so far, a karma that I'm hoping to cultivate, is to figure out which wall we're heading towards and whether we can alter course. By evaluating law's karma rigorously and honestly, I'm hoping to better understand its place alongside the much wider world of other normative systems, which too have their own karma. In the end, perhaps I'm looking for another kind of merit book, a society-wide one, which counts all karma, both positive and negative, in the hopes that we will all have a better rebirth. After all, after all, it's that score, 
our shared karma credit rating, which would seem to matter most. And if all else fails, if our collective action fails to put good outcomes ahead of bad, perhaps we can try again in another lifetime, maybe as monkeys. Thank you for coming. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou uh, katoa ko Jessica Palmer toko inga ko te manakura o te kita aranui uh, a te wananga o Otago tēnē. Um, I am the Pro Vice-Chancellor of the Division of Humanities, which is the division um, that has the lucky pleasure of having been in its um, ambit. And it's my pleasure as um, the Pro Vice-Chancellor to provide both a comment on his lecture and a vote of thanks on behalf of his colleagues. I'm also a professor of law. <laughs> and there were a few wee side looks and comments to me throughout this lecture. And, and when I was thinking about what to talk about, I did think that as a, as a sometime insurance law lecturer, I could perhaps spend the comment talking about the complications inherent in the concept of causation. But I'll leave that for another day. Ben argued that society understands law as a primary domain in which conflict is corrected, that law ensures peace and order and flourishing, and he is suspicious. He's suspicious that law in its traditional form may not actually achieve all of those important and necessary things. He offers two interesting answers to the question as to whether law does or doesn't cause good outcomes. I think he argued first that the formalist conception of the law is too limited, that it is binding on us in a way that isn't helpful, and something other than or more than law as we traditionally understand it is needed to resolve our social dilemmas. We need to understand a more realist version of the law that recognises its interaction with people, that what happens with people on the ground is what matters as to whether the law has it right or not. And that the way to understand or think about that is to consider thinking processes and knowledge categories beyond those we traditionally assign to that camp called law. That we need to think beyond and outside of and in doing so, he calls us into a dialogue, particularly with the social sciences. And I, as a lawyer, and a lawyer here at Otago, am very grateful that uh, Ben has been an, a strong advocate of this, not just because of the beauty that is interdisciplinary study, but because I think he is bang on the mark on this one, that lawyers and society need to dialogue together. And when I mean society, I mean all of those others who shed so much light on what's happening with humanity and how we interact. So it's wonderful, Ben, that in offering that answer, you are showing us a bit about what drives you. And I want to congratulate you and your colleagues who are here today who've set up that centre for law and society here at Otago. It's an incredibly important centre and it's going to do some fantastic work. So bravo. The second answer that you gave to this important question as to whether law causes good outcomes or not is to challenge again our conception of the law. That perhaps our conception of the law itself is too narrow in that we have firmly embedded it in a Westminster type understanding of the law. And that there are other conceptions or systems of law that may be needed to help us resolve our social dilemmas. And Ben, your work in particular is highlighting the value that Buddhist philosophies and ideas and legal understandings may bring to these questions about peace and order. And although I recognise it's, it's, it's in its early stage in terms of your research, it's another really exciting part of your IPL that you are looking back to what you've done, but you're giving some indication of what's to come. And I can see huge value in what you have to say. It's a privilege um, in giving this comment that I get to have an advanced copy of uh, Ben's lecture, which gives me a bit more time to reflect on what he's saying. And it led me to think a bit more about the implications of what he's saying for us here in Aotearoa. If what he is saying is true, what would it mean for us in this land in this time? If, if it is true, Maybe our concept of the law, or what we expect of it, is both too demanding and perhaps too narrow. 
Law is itself a social construct. It's a reflection of, and it's constrained by, our beliefs and norms. It's both norm-creating and norm-affirming. And in Aotearoa, a state which Ben pointed out has no written constitution, we readily affirm Te Tiriti o Waitangi as one of our, and probably our principal, foundational document. And that with it being our foundational document, it effectively ought to be treated as carrying constitutional value. I've no doubt that that statement is true, and our students, both within the law school and more widely across the division university, are receiving their education in an incredibly exciting time for us in this society as we grapple with what it means to give constitutional weight to Te Tiriti o Waitangi. And it strikes me, in thinking about the points that Ben has made, that our kōrero and our um, whakamana of the treaty, that is our making the treaty count, putting it into action, might be more effective if we were to recognise that the treaty was first and foremost a covenant. And a keeping of covenant relies much more on virtue and morality and a commitment to the good of the collective than it does on law and enforcement, as we traditionally understand those things. The Buddhist monk and his understanding of law and the wisdom and advice of those who are specialists in fields other than the law may have much to teach us about the cultivation of such virtue and morality in order that this land, this whenua, this society can truly flourish with the document as the treaty as a part of our constitution. Ben, I thank you that your work points this out to us. But I also want to say, and it was, it was made pretty clear by Will too, it's not just your work that draws us in and points us out to the importance of virtue and morality that you as a person do. You are a person, a colleague, who demonstrates the strength of virtue in droves. And so, in my humble opinion, your cumulative balance of good actions is inspiring. Does the law cause good outcomes? As all self-respecting law students know, the answer to most legal questions is, can my lawyers in the room give the answer? It depends, <laughs> it depends. Ben has demonstrated the truth of that answer this evening, and in so doing, he's encouraged us to think beyond a rigid and narrow view of the law to one that must engage with the wisdom of other fields of knowledge and other cultural conceptions of the law in order that good outcomes will follow. His answers give rise to further equally interesting questions, which, as all self-respecting academics know, is essential to ensure that a drink afterwards carries on the dialogue. Our current humanity strategic plan has this in our identity statement. We are a community of creative and diverse critical thinkers who explore how in humans interact with one another and with the world around them. We engage with the past, imagine the future, and develop people-centered solutions to local, national, and global problems. Ben, I think you embody that mission statement with absolute ease and class. In addition to your exceptional research, you are a wonderful teacher and a colleague, and it is a great pleasure to offer this vote of thanks on behalf of Te Kete Aranui and all of your colleagues. Nō reira, fa ka mihi ki a koe ahorangi Ben Chantal. Ka mihi nui ki a koe mō ta mahi mō ta whaikōrero tino pō. Tino, tine pō. Ka mutu pēa, ka mihi nui. I have the great pleasure of presenting you with this um, mento of this evening and to say thank you and well done.